Did it throw this down? Oh, it does. Okay, well, um, as you'll see, um, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, a joke and uh, thanks for uh, sticking around to the very end of uh, what is, I gather, the logic session, uh, the Monday morning logic session of uh, this conference. Um, and uh, I will promise that the logic that comes here um, it won't be uh, nearly as ferocious as uh, it, you know, the title might see, might suggest. But anyway, I want to start with a joke. No doubt, uh, several of you have already seen this joke before. It's uh, it's an old New Yorker cartoon, and I know that some of you have already seen this before because Hugh Price at the uh, Wilfrid Sellers Centennial Conference uh, opened up his talk with this uh, projection. All right, and uh, my topic today is going to concern a decision that um, has to be made by our hirsute forebearers, our pre-Rileyan ancestors, um, along about the same time as they come to speak in declarative sentences. And the question that uh, our hirsute ancestors will have to answer is whether they should reinforce sentences that are uttered truly and sanction those that are not, or whether they should do things the other way around, that is, reinforce false speaking and sanction truth-telling instead. Now, uh, the theme of the conference here is uh, why and how we give and ask for reasons. And it turns out, of course, that um, we prioritize truth-telling, okay? Um, we take freestanding utterances of a statement to be normed on the speaker's belief along with the truth of that statement's content. When somebody utters a declarative sentence and then they utter another, then unless there are indications otherwise, it is commonplace in natural language, including ours, to interpret them as having asserted both of those statements and to have done so more or less independently. So freestanding utterances of statements are typically understood as assertions and so understood to be normed to truth, knowledge, or warranted belief. This default in favor of assertion, which is so natural to be almost invisible, would seem to go far to explain the tendency amongst philosophers of language to accord that particular speech act some sort of conceptual primacy in our language game. As Brandon puts it in a way so as to evoke, or perhaps provoke, Wittgenstein's Geist, assertion belongs at the heart or in the downtown of our understanding of discursive practice. Now, why is this so natural and universal? Why do we think it would be so absurd or perverse to have an inverted or topsy-turvy sprachspiel in which freestanding utterances are instead understood to be denials and so normed to falsity or warranted disbelief. Now, of course, this aspect of our linguistic practice was not invisible to Frege. That's why in his logical diagrams, he always includes that vertical assertion stroke. But in Frege's system, assertion is the only force that he has in his notation. And so it has generally been dismissed as a quaint little relic. And instead, uh, folks these days generally follow um, purse. And they just assume that freestanding diagrams or symbolizations of a sentence are understood to be asserted. But by way of motivating this uh, talk here, I want us to consider a um, couple of demonstrations in a few alternate logical systems of a sequent here. The sequent is you know, uh, a constructive dilemma. So it's just P wedge Q, P arrow R, Q arrow S, therefore R wedge S. And this, of course, is a demonstration of the validity of that sequent um, using a what's called a truth tree. 
uh, first uh, popularized by Richard Jeffries, and he claims that he borrowed it from Raymond Smullyan. And you've probably seen these things in introductory logic text. Maybe you've taught them uh, on your own. Uh, what they do is they work by uh, listing the premises along a tree and the negation of the conclusion and then working out the various consequences of asserting premises and also asserting the conclusion negated. And so here you have uh, negation R wedge S uh, from the side of affirmation uh, that uh, the consequences are uh, affirm the negation of R and affirm the negation of S. And with your tree structure, sometimes occasionally applying these rules require you to branch and so on. And what actually happens is branches close uh, when you um, are forced in a position where you assert some uh, content, say S, and you've also have already asserted uh, negation S, branches close. And a fully closed tree, uh, it's basically its purpose shows the inconsistency of affirming everything, all of the premises and the negation of the conclusion. And the reason, of course, that works is we have this simple rule for negation. If you have an entailment, uh, so gamma double turn style phi, that's just in case uh, gamma in conjunction with its negation is inconsistent. Okay. So that's just, a, you've probably seen this before. Let's move on to just a slight, what might think of as a notational variant uh, on uh, a truth tree. It's what I call bilateral tableau. Um, I prefer it, I learned it from uh, Michael Perloff back at Pitt. And it's basically the same thing, except we have sides of a tree, uh, one side representing truth or perhaps af uh, affirmation or assertion, the, uh, the other side representing uh, denial. And we're basically working out in terms of the uh, consequences of affirming premises while denying a conclusion. And you can see from our purposes, I'm not gonna dwell very uh, much on this, but for our purposes, the thing to notice is the structure of the tree really doesn't change much. Again, I, I prefer this. I think that this uh, um, illustrates a lot of themes in uh, bilaterality that have already come up. Preston talked about these trees, raised these trees in, in connection with uh, his question to Bob. But what I'm actually on about is let's go further. So here is another structurally similar tree except that it works completely, so to speak, on the side of falsity. And so um, it, there's a rule of another rule of inference, uh, uh, sorry, a rule of entailment that supports this. Essentially what we do is you, we keep the conclusion on the side of denial or the side of falsity, and then you systematically negate all the premises and what you can see is that uh, this tree structurally looks just like the other two. Now, the point of all this um, is to uh, uh, the point of all this is to illustrate that one can do, so to speak, logic using well falsity trees, or you, one can do logic uh, with a false front face. You could do logic completely on the side of denial, not on the side of assertion. Uh, just uh, permute the, uh, the uh, rules a little bit. And um, there is no sequence that you can uh, get. There's no logical uh, demonstration that you can perform completely on the side of truth that you can't uh, make visible also on the side of falsity and vice versa. So the point is, and remember our question is, why speak in favor, uh, why do we speak in terms of assertions rather than denials? The answer to that question is not really answered by any appeal, at least to formal logic. That formal logic is neutral between affirmation um, and, and denial. Now, I'm going to go up to my spoken notes and see where I am in my uh,
in my outline. Okay. So the question that um, is pressed upon us is that while such a system of logic that prioritizes falsity and falsity preserving inferences, okay, it's adopted perhaps by the denizens of Hegel's inverted world, or perhaps by eccentric Antipodeans, or maybe a rabid Popperian uh, or two. Why does this sort of system seem so absurd to us? Why do we have this preference for uh, truth rather than falsity? And these last three slides show that we will have to look to something other than formal logic to find the reason or reasons why we have such a predilection for speaking truly rather than falsely. And surely we think such a reason must exist because norming our statements to truth appears to be common to all human languages. However, you won't find the answer to this question in, for instance, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on assertion. While there is plenty of discussion about how best to characterize the specific norms of assertion, whether they be directly normed to truth or rather indirectly normed to it through a speaker's epistemic situation. There is virtually no discussion about why it is assertion that accords such pride of place or why it should be truth to which our bare utterances should be normed. Now, I'm not the most diligent scholar. For instance, I haven't looked at the recent 2000, uh, 2020 Oxford Handbook on Assertion but I'm not really aware of anyone who has pressed this question in quite so bald a manner as I am trying to do here. And perhaps that is because bilateral, this is a question that would occur mostly to a bilateralist and the serious investigation of bilateralism has only recently begun to gain much steam. But I invite you, that is you out there in internet world and you out in the audience, um, I invite you to imagine the practical limitations or infelicities of a topsy discursive practice which puts falsity uh, on the front foot. And I invite you to consider as well the learnability of such a practice ab initio. Okay, so the invitation, think about it is to come up with your own hypotheses for why we norm the truth rather than falsity, and so why we speak in assertions rather than denials. However, I caution you, the task might prove a little more challenging than one might at first suppose. For the parallels between assertion and denial really do run deep. For instance, one might argue that denial is hopelessly ambiguous because denials come in both strong and weak flavors. However, Schluter and Unservati have recently shown that assertion has both strong and weak forms as well. Or one might think that our preference for truth is vindicated simply by looking to the observational dimension of our language use. After all, we're primarily and immediately interested in what's actually out there, not with what's not out there, thus perhaps prioritizing a metaphysics of presence over that of absence. But let's use some imagination on behalf of the topsy-turvians. A topsy-turvian practice might understand some form of negation to be bound up within their regular sign of observation, such as low or look. Thus under conditions where we might assert, low, there's a rabbit, the topsy-turvians would just as easily use an observation exclamation to deny something like, not a rabbit over there. Indeed, just as Frege sought to dispense with the consideration of denial altogether by unpacking it as an assertion of a negation, a topsy-turvian Frege might just introduce negation to go the other way around, showing in effect that anything one can do with an asserted statement could be done just as well with the strong denial of that statement's negation. 
disbelieving that logic is not the study of falsity, our topsy-turvy in Frege would deny Frege's insistence that logic is the study of truth. And he would be partly correct. One should rather disbelieve that logic is not the study of entailment. And topsy-turvy in psychologists would sincerely deny belief psychology by pointing out, in effect, that their actions and expressions arise out of the contents of their disbelief boxes. I had some other cute phrases there talk about how uh, they would find paradoxical uh, the truth teller and so forth. But for my point, for my part, I, I propose to pursue a line of reasoning initiated by that great sage, Charles Sanders Peirce, the sage of Arisby, here pictured in the corner. I, as mentioned a few paragraphs back, though Peirce was fully aware of the force content distinction, he dispensed with an explicit sign of assertion in his graphical notation for logic. Instead, any freestanding statement written down on his diagrammatic expanse, what he calls his femic sheet, was thereby to be understood as asserted. Hence, he explicitly understood this expanse to be the sheet of assertion. So if there's an owl in the tree, or a propositional symbol thereof, perhaps O, is scribed on the sheet, we are to understand that sentence as being asserted. And if that sheet also bears the inscription, the dog is barking, or a symbol thereof, then that statement is also to be understood as asserted. So here we have this first uh, depiction of the femic sheet or uh, Purse's sheet of assertion here on the left. It has uh, the depiction of two proposition, uh, two, two statements being asserted. But then the question that Peirce naturally raises is what are we to do uh, when we wish to, for instance, in a conditional, display a conditional, but when you display a conditional, you are asserting neither the antecedent or the, uh, or the consequent. And so what he does is this. And it's here represented on the fourth diagram here. Uh, he says, I'll document this in a minute, but he basically says is when we wish to display a conditional, what we must do is we, we, mean, we need to enclose both the antecedent and the consequent with a, what he calls a fence or a gate or a cut. And what the effect of this is to take the contents of the cut off the sheet of assertion. And then further, since we need to distinguish the content of the antecedent from the content of the consequent, he has us draw a further line. There's my cursor here. A further inner loop. This is what he calls an inner loop now uh, around the consequent position. And so uh, forming what he calls a scroll. Now, later on, Person is more mature work, Peirce begins to understand these loops as acting as prohibitions. Uh, so what you do is you, uh, you what, what you do by talking about a prohibition of assertables, you place the assertables on the, well, you do something different, but I'll, uh, for the moment, I'll, I'll speak in these terms. You uh, place them on the sheet of assertion. And if you want to deny, for instance, or you want to take something off the sheet of assertion, off the sheet of assertion, prohibited from being asserted, you, for instance, will. So if you want to deny that uh, the dog is barking, you draw a circle around it, in effect, denying it. If you want to say that two statements, for instance, well, two statements are not, or even stronger, may not be uh, asserted together, you'll draw a circle around them both. And the interesting thing here is his earlier scroll turns out to be, um, he understands the inner the inner loops to be themselves uh, possible graphs that can be on the sheet of assertion. And so this amounts to a prohibition of affirming an antecedent and denying 
a consequent. It's basically, it's decomposing the conditional um, as a, um, essentially as a form of conjunction and then prohibitions. It's kind of the thrust of one of, of, uh, of Preston's uh, uh, in his question uh, to Bob is that um, might there be something more basic than uh, the conditional? And yes, uh, if your purse, uh, the conditional is actually a rather complex diagram uh, by comparison to others. This is interesting um, because we have in effect a negation operator and conjunction, uh, the juxtaposition is, is a conjunction, we have an expressively complete system for, uh, for sentential logic. And uh, this diagram here looks like a bunch of, <laughs> this looks like a very unfortunate uh, eye test where, you know, you see O and D together and you can't figure out which is which. Uh, uh, this one right here uh, amounts to the prohibition of denying both O and denying D. And that uh, essentially, it's a prohibition on two denials. That is um, his device for, um, uh, that's his device for symbolizing a disjunction. Real quickly here, uh, this is in effect the footnotes for, the, uh, for that previous slide. Uh, so he talks about uh, what happens when you need to express a conditional, and he tells us you need to draw a fence or a closed line around it. Uh, and uh, the question then arises, which counts, uh, uh, we need to draw a further loop around, the, uh, around one of them. And this is his uh, initial justification for why the inner loop has to go around uh, the uh, consequent. So this is just a bunch of footnotes. All right, this is actually my favorite slide of the whole talk, because before Peirce comes up with the, uh, the existential graphs, uh, his mature system, he played around with something called the entitative graphs, or where his task was that of representing uh, the illative, what he calls the illitative, or the consequence relation, basically what he thought of as alternately the relationship between antecedents and consequence or premises and conclusion. And earlier notations had, um, had offered various signs such as this or this right here to signify that relation. And what Peirce does is he notices that this sign for elation, the sign for consequence, really could be uh, broken up into two signs. The first is the line, the horizontal line on top, which he says applies to the antecedent. And the second is the line that separates the antecedent from the consequent. So we have both of these, we have a line over, we have either a wedge or a plus. And, and uh, you might have noticed in uh, some, or you might know that in some other notations, a line over something that is a uh, negation. So what this amounts to, at least if we consider just a, 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 a material conditional here, uh, this sign actually decomposes into a precursor to his cut and a disjunct. And so what purses, or you know, in the other one here, we have a line over the premises and a plus, which on some notations, both the V and the plus has been used as a sign of disjunction. What he does eventually then is he dispenses with this second sign and just thinks of uh, things written down on a sheet of assertion. Now juxtapositions outside of any cuts are disjunctive and juxtapositions within any cut is conjunctive. So it's easiest to go to this uh, 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 diagram here. We have three premises joined together. What it basically says is you may not, uh, you may not assert all three of these uh, or, yeah, well, you must assert um, either all three of these or the conclusion. And what he notices is that, or the, you must assert the negation of all three of these together or the conclusion. 
And what he notes is that if you have a negation of a conjunction, De Morgan's just allows you to split the various premises, and then you can uniformly treat conjunction uniformly as, uh, as uh, no, sorry, you can uniformly treat juxtaposition on his sheet now as disjunctive. Okay, and so we get what um, uh, what Peirce's earlier system, the, these are the entitative graphs. Oh, shoot, only five minutes? Eek. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I am going to smooth, speed right through that. Um, the entitative graphs, um, on the entitative graphs, uh, Peirce uh, says that they are hauntingly right here. He says basically two systems are about as good as each other, except there's an unnaturalness and an aniconicity that haunts every part of the system of entitative graphs, which he says is a curious example of how late a development simplicity is. All right, so what we have here is a, a uh, what's going on with Peirce is he notices that there is a, a mismatch between, in the entitative graphs, a mismatch between the force of the sheet of assertion. If the, the femic sheet is to be understood as assertive, then you don't want to uh, represent juxtaposition as disjunctive. So the question then arises uh, is, why couldn't you just, uh, so to speak, uh, work instead of from a sheet of assertion, from a sheet of denial and making a real, well, a medium-sized story uh, short. This is where uh, uh, Peirce basically, uh, when, when I made a caveat, uh, he really thinks of the cut as being a cut in the sheet of assertion that exposes something from behind. The something from behind is the sheet of denial. And what the, what the cuts do is they expose what is lying behind that sheet of assertion. So the question is, and this is where Peirce turns out to be an out and out bilateralist, you know, literally two, shot, two sides to his femic sheet. Uh, the question then arises is why don't or why doesn't Peirce uh, consider operating instead from the opposite side, the obverse, the rougher side of the sheet of assertion? Why does he pri himself prior prioritize assertion over negation, over uh, uh, denial? And here's the, uh, the, what you might think of as um, the, the, the story is really kind of disappointing for such a grand question. Why do we uh, speak in terms of truth rather than denial? The answer is disappointingly mundane. Because if you think, for instance, suppose these things are on the sheet of denial. Okay. So these are written on the backside of the sheet of assertion. And the question then is, well, should we understand this as denying both of these separately, or are we to understand these as denying them collectively, OK? Now, if you just think of the sheet of denial as containing sentences on, a, you know, sentences written down, if you're working with a sheet of denial, you're, need, you're going to need to add this little bit of punctuation, so to speak, that serves no other purpose than to individuate speech acts or the, in the, to individuate separate acts of denial. So real quickly, uh, think about uh, denying this, okay, something that Peirce might have denied, and denying this, something else that uh, Peirce might have uh, denied, not did deny. Um, the effect of them both is to deny their disjunction. This, of course, denies their conjunction. And so there is a systematic ambiguity 
on that backside of that sheet, whether you're denying things collectively or de denying things um, uh, singly. Well, I think that that, I think that, that ramifies uh, into the spoken medium, of course, as well. Because think about what happens when you speak, okay? Speak kind of looks like that. Speech kind of looks like that. And so what you want is on your, you know, we, we blast things out into space, something like a, an airy femic sheet. And the question is why we have to understand it as assertive rather than as something else. Because we don't have, in essence, ways of framing those things nicely. We want to understand, you know, this is a, you know, the separate acts are disjunctive. And the only way that uh, you get juxtaposition to work nicely um, conjunctively like that, well, as to, well, so understand juxtaposition as conjunction. And when you understand juxtaposition as conjunction, uh, that explains why the femic sheet, that vast expanse of air uh, that we blast our speech acts out onto, it's undifferentiated. It's like this. And so the only way that you don't get an ambiguity such as that which happens on the sheet of denial is to understand the undifferentiated expanse in which we broadcast our speech acts out of as a sheet of assertion, not denial. And so I had this nice little flowery and overwrought conclusion that uh, basically says, this is what explains um, in the Zoroastrian struggle between the forces of Asha, that is truth, and the forces of falsity, that is druge, okay? The answer to the reason why we favor assertion, that is speaking truly, over the forces of denial, speaking falsely. The reason for that turns on a really mundane feature of assertion, namely that it, and not denial, distributes into juxtaposition or conjunction. And so I'm going to close out this session on an extremely deflating note, you know, it, you know in, in fine uh, Pittsburgh style, um, is that uh, the reason we love truth so much so much that you know, some of us might even uh, you know, think of it in conjunction with um, academia's second oldest profession, that is behind geometry, philosophy. Uh, we might enshrine it every time we think of that word philosophy. Uh, the reason for that is simply a mundane, pragmatic feature of discourse and nothing more grand than that. And with that, hopefully I got that under time. I will leave you on that, uh, on that deflationary note. Uh, thanks. Uh, the owl of Minerva is just about to take flight. Okay, uh, questions? Thanks, this was really interesting. Um, first one comment, then one question. The first comment is that I was surprised that you left out the Tractatus because in the Tractatus there is a little bit on um, what if all our assertions meant their negation? And Wittgenstein is asking himself that question. His answer is, if we went in for that, 
convention, we would still be asserting at the end of the day. Our negations would just mean their assertions. So he's, he, I think he claims he has an answer, and I think his answer is different from yours. So one thing would be to um, be, would, would be interesting to, to compare and contrast. Well, he's putting himself in a position uh, in the, so to speak, the, the game of giving and asking for reasons. Uh, but um, um, he's, he's not negating. It's not an assertion of an, um, it's not the assertion of a negation, it's a denial, and that's distinct. Um, Wittgenstein, if he's following Ramsey, should know uh, the difference too. Oh, yeah, I, well, one would have to look whether that matters at this point, but um, yeah, so there's definitely some, actually, no, I will, but, not, but, I will, I will but, not go there, but let, let, me, let me ask you another question, because I'm thinking that your, the argument at the end of, that you present for why we should go for the assertions rather than denials, doesn't that depend on you presenting the sheet as, as it were one sheet? But it seems that in our language, what is actually happening is that we sentences have periods. So insofar as we have periods, we can individuate individual sentences. And then we could think that, you know, we have a convention that the periods mark. That, yeah, written language does. Uh, uh, um, but um, yeah, the, the, the bit that I glossed over really quick is I had us imagine um, a game, uh, you know, where we're playing the opposite day game. You might have played this you know, sometimes you try to speak opposite of what it is you really mean, uh, or you as a childhood game, it usually ends in, you know, breaks down and ends in hilarity, uh, a little bit of hilarity that's uh, uh, less gruesome than squid games. Uh, but um, um, what I had as what I had in the in the in the bit that I skipped over is I had us imagine a game, and I had us instead of just saying things I had us putting uh, messages on a card. And then the question was, okay, well, I put, you know, the owl is in the tree, and I put the dog is barking. You know, I have two cards there, and what if, and that amounts to a disjunction, uh, uh, that amounts to a denial in effect of their disjunction, because the sheet of denial is more something else, somehow disjunctive. Uh, what if I wanted to deny something weaker? That is, that it's both the case that the dog is in the tree and the, and, and no, sorry, the owl is in the tree and the dog is barking. Well, then I put them on the same card. So in effect, yes, I did, um, I did talk, I, I did put punctuations there via, or groupings by way of note cards. But then I said, but we don't have thought boxes or note cards. Um, out here. And so that is why even with, you know. <laughs> um, Don't we have sentences? Don't we have sen we, complete sentences versus incomplete sentences? That's where esoteric force right. attaches. But I, but, I, but I assert one thing. That's one, one sentence. Then I assert another one. And then the question is, do I draw? I mean, the sentences don't help. The question is, do I put the box around them both, or do I put the box around them individually? And if I spoke in terms of denial, I would have to settle that question. So it's more than just a sentence. Oh, there we go. I have what seems to me like a really dumb question. Um, you can tell me it's dumb, if it is. Yeah, uh, right. it's isn't a, the could be a reason dumb. that uh, if you take assertion to be basic, isn't the reason that assertion is basic is because uh, a language based on denial would be unlearnable? I mean, you can't teach a kid what's green by showing them a bunch of not green things and saying, this is not green, this is not green, this is not green. That was the force of the point. I'm not, yeah, I don't think that that's a dumb question, but I worry that that is too facile a response or that's too facile an objection, because that was the bit about the, uh, you know, don't we want to, uh, aren't we really concerned about a metaphysics of presence, not absence? Um, when we learn observation vocabulary, aren't we interested in what's out there? And I'm not sure that, um, yeah, the learnability point might be a little, 
my response is, let's try to use a little bit of imagination here. And just like if in my lows, turns out to have an embedded some kind of negation in there. So when I say, not a rabbit, and I'm really denying not a rabbit, that's sort of say to, it is a rabbit. And, and I'm not sure that I can't teach, well, I mean, I can't because I'm habituated in the way I am, but I'm not uh, convinced that a topsy-turvian culture couldn't. That's, so, you know, so I'm hesitant about, you guys can come up with hypotheses, but then I really encourage you to try to use your imagination and press it. So I've, I've got a question. <clears throat> I'm not sure if this matters, but when you were looking at the trees, and so we started with truth trees where you're just looking at assertions and the tree closes when you get an assertion of a sentence and its negation. And then there are bilateral trees where we use assertion and denial, and then a tree closes when you assert and deny the same sentence. But then you looked at falsity trees and you said it had the same structure. And that wasn't clear to me it did because what that structure was is that the tree closes when on every branch you've got the denial of a sentence and its negation. So the trees work, I mean, as the topsy turvians work, they would reason by subcontraries. And so you've got, you know, and they would put subcontraries first and foremost. Well, we don't, we don't, we're a assert, we're assertibleist and we don't like, so we don't naturally reason uh, through subcontraries, but they do. And so what the tree does is it exposes the inconsistency of holding a bunch of things false at once. Well, but so this is what it was, it wasn't clear to me. So on that falsity tree, you had uh, say S and not S, both denied. But it seems like I can do that without, I mean, if I assert the King of France is bald and the King of France is not bald, I've, I'm, I'm in trouble. But if I've denied the King of France is bald and the King of France is not bald, it's not clear to me that I'm in trouble there. And so that looks like an asymmetry between, on the one hand, the truth trees where you've just got assertion and then you've got negation as content and the bilateral trees where you've got assertion and denial. And then on the other side, just the falsity. Trees. You just recapitulated uh, the objection to um, Inservati and uh, Schluter that, he, that they tried to overcome with the notion of weak assertion. So, um, uh, yes, the falsity trees um, are operating with what are, what are called strong denials, not weak denials, such as, uh, such as what you just uh, mentioned. But Interati and Schluter uh, point out that there's a phenomenon of weak assertion as well, and that doesn't stop us from, from much. So we can all go to the bar and play the denial game. I think so. I can't tell if Yako's cue is from this session or the previous one. There's a string of cues there. So. Yeah. Yako, if you're around, you're welcome to ask a question or anyone online. Otherwise, I, I suppose we can uh, uh, tell Dave that he did not do a good job and uh, <laughs> we'll understand that as a denial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's all right. I, I can I can interpret you any way I want. <laughs> all right. So thank, thank you very everybody. much.